Hello interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. I've got a MacBook Pro here. This one is a A1502. I've got the back cover off already. I'll explain why in a moment. Um, and it doesn't turn on. So um, I'll just show you what symptoms we've got. I'm going to plug in a uh, USB Type-C to MagSafe adapter. And with the Paul Daniels meter, we can just see what it tries to do. And of course, now I've started recording, it's doing different things. However, the important factor here is that, as you can see, we've got no power and we've got a little bit of a ripple there. And if you're really astute, you might notice that this looks awfully familiar. This is exactly the same behavior that we had from another MacBook Pro recently that had a shorted um, capacitor on the right USB port, uh, on the optional board, uh, the um, right I.O. board. Um, and of course, you know, if I try and press the power button, nothing happens. Uh, now, this has changed slightly. Before I started recording, um, when I first put the laptop on the bench, it was actually charging the battery. So we had charge current, but if you press the power button, that charge current disappeared, it did nothing, and then it slowly crept back up to charge again. Um, either way, these symptoms look very, very familiar. It looks like a short circuit. So what I then did was I took the back cover off, unplugged the battery, and started having a look. So let's take a look on the inside here. I'll just disconnect the battery again. Now, with a short circuit in the laptop, and with me having just recently had a laptop where we had one of those shorted USB port capacitors, I thought, what are the chances that I've got another one? Well, let's have a look. So I'll put the multimeter into resistance mode. The battery is unplugged. Let's have a look at the uh, let's have a look at the rails. So um, we already know that we have PP PP three V four two because we have a green light on the charger or an orange light rather. Um, we'll check PP three uh, we'll check PP bus G three hot for good measure, which we can get from this current sense resistor down here, and that's up in the tens of mega ohms, so that's completely fine. So what about PP five V S three? So this is the 5 volt rail. Um, this is the 5 volt rail that powers USB ports and stuff like that. If we've got a problem on the uh, right I.O. board, and it's on the left here because the laptop is upside down, if we've got a problem with the I.O. board, we'll see a short on this rail. So let's check that again. And look at that. Once again, the 5 volt rail is shorted. So what are the chances that it is the right I.O. board? Well, let's have a look. I'm going to take the uh, I'm going to take this cable out so we can get to the power cable underneath it. Uh, all I have to do is pick up the right screwdriver. There we go. So this cable here, this carries ground five volt and three volt over to the I/O board, and if I disconnect that, if there's if the short circuit is on the right I/O board then we should find that it appears on here. So I'll put my black probe on a screw hole on the I.O. board because that's what we're measuring now. We need the ground plane of the I.O. board and we'll check ground pin, a zero, ground pin, a zero. Then the next one is the three volt rail, I believe. There's high resistance there. And then the five volt rail is also high resistance. So it looks like it's not the I.O. board this time. Let's put our black probe over on the main logic board and we'll check the 5 volt rail again. And we're still shorted. So we've got a short circuit on the 5 volt rail, but this time it's on the main logic board, not on the I.O. board. So this is the point where I'll tell you a quick story of what the customer was telling me. The customer was telling me that they were using a um, an external hard drive at the time when it failed. And the hard drive they brought in is pretty grotty. It's really old. So, you know, maybe that was a, a heavy drive. And maybe we've got an issue with the power supply to the left USB port, which is on the main logic board. So that's what I'm guessing here. I think we're going to find um, the same deal that we had on the right I.O. board except this time it's on the main logic board. So 
Uh, I'm going to start by taking the logic board out so we can take a look at that and let's see if we can find it again. Um, this I think is going to be fairly straightforward because where it's just a 5 volt short all we have to do is just isolate it a bit further and then we can probably use a quick stab of injection just to highlight where the actual fault is. So I'm going to go into fast forward mode while I take the logic board out um, and I'm feeling lazy so we're just going to do all of this in hyperlapse while I watch YouTube. Right, so we've got this board out now. I've had a look over it and I can't see any scorch marks or skid marks or anything, any visual anomalies on it. Um, I think I'm probably going to go straight to voltage injection here because I think this is a very simple case of um, probably a dead capacitor somewhere on the 5 volt rail. Um, and we'll, what we'll do is this isn't the best example of how I wanted to do this, but let's do it anyway because I want to experiment. Um, a while back, the last time I was doing injection, uh, I mentioned about a voltage injection checklist. You know, I said, oh, let's go through the checklist before voltage injection. Um, now, when I said that, I didn't actually have a checklist, but someone in the comments said, you mentioned a checklist. What's your full checklist? And I was like, that's a good idea. I should make a checklist. <laughs> so... Um, I need to, I want to actually properly formulate this. If you want to know more about voltage injection, I have a video that goes into it at length. And if you're doing this kind of work, I strongly recommend you watch that video because it actually goes into the details of why voltage injection isn't something you should just do at random without actually knowing what you're doing. Now, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not a superstar at repair. But I know enough about this to know when it's safe to inject. And that means that for me, I'll just say, let's inject, because I just know that it's the right time to do it. But um, uh, we, and by we, I mean the repair community, we still regularly see people who will just immediately inject at random onto the board. And when you say, why did you inject there at that value? They don't know which means they didn't really understand what they were doing with voltage injection. So we do still have some lines to cross. And this is why it's important to add context to this and not treat injection as this magic cure-all. It's a very powerful tool, make no mistake. But we do need to actually understand what we're doing. So um, why would I be worried about injecting? Well, there's a short circuit on this board, but I don't know what's shorted. When I inject the power, I don't know where it's going. So is it going anywhere that could do damage to the board? Well, um, what we, first we have to ask ourselves which rail is shorted. So quite often we're dealing with a short where it's a main power rail short. So on a MacBook logic board, that would be PP bus G3 hot. And that powers more or less everything else in the laptop. So when you've got a short circuit on the main power rail, there's a lot of places that could be going, and when you inject onto it, there's a lot of possible places that power might go that you don't want it to go, such as directly into the CPU core, or directly into the GPU core, and so on and so forth. The 5 volt rail is a bit different. Um, the, uh, on the 5 volt rail, we're more finding just other stuff, but really, the most the, the place on this motherboard that we would be most worried about stuff going to is the CPU or the PCH, because that's the only real silicon on this board that actually matters. We've also got the SMC, but, um, so I don't know why I pointed, that's the audio chip, I don't know why I pointed at that. The SMC is that guy. And we also have RAM, and what other silicon have we got? That's about it, really. So, these are, so the silicon, like the RAM and the SMC and the PCH and stuff, that's what we don't want to damage. So where are those powered from? Well, the CPU is getting its main power from PP bus G3 hot. Um, v core is which is this section here, that is powered from the main power rail. We've got a five volt short, so if we inject on there, it's not going to go into V core. So that's fine. Okay. Well, what about the PCH? The PCH gets power from lots of places, including the 5 volt and the 3.3 volt rails. It's not necessarily powered from those rails per se, but it's got its hooks in those rails. It's watching them. So 
that's something we need to consider. If you have a dead PCH, then it's there's a very good chance that you're going to see lots of problems everywhere. Now, I mentioned earlier on that I saw this laptop actually charging as well. That's not managed by the PCH, but this doesn't feel like it's got a bad PCH. And, you know, we could have a look at some other rails. So what about the 3 volt rail? Is there any problems with that? We know the 3.3 volt rail appears on this connector that goes to the I.O. board. So let's measure that. It wasn't shorted at the I.O. board, but what about on this side? If we check the top pin, that's 5 volt, I think. So there's our short. So the next pin down, that's the 3.3 volt rail. And that's at 34, 35 kilo ohms. So because we don't have a shorted 3.3 volt rail, that doesn't guarantee that the PCH works. But when you have a dead PCH, you're probably going to see multiple shorted rails and multiple faults over the laptop. And we're not really seeing that. So I don't think that's the problem here. Well, the RAM, where's that powered from? That has its own regulator, which is going to come off of PPBus G3 Hot, I believe. And you know what? We can check this. Let me just open the schematics. This is an 8204924. And I'm just going to click on a random RAM chip here. And its power is 1v8 and 1v2S3. Not sure which one is its main power, but let's just check them both anyway. That's coming from these guys over here. And what about that 1v8 line? Mm, that's coming from this guy. Which comes from this guy. And that comes from the 3.3 volt rail. Uh, cool. Let's track that other one again. So 1v2 S3 comes from these guys. So PPDDRS3 reg goes through here, that comes from here, and this is powered from PPBus S5HS Computing. That is the main power rail. PPBus S5HS Computing is, is derived from PPBus G3 Hot, and we can check that. You can, uh, somewhere around here, that will... Uh, I'm not going to find it now, but if you follow the money back, that will eventually go back to PPBus G3R. So the RAM is also powered from the main power rail. So we know if we inject on the 5 volt rail, we're not going to hit RAM at any point. Cool. Okay. The SMC, that has its own power source. Um, so again, we don't need to worry about that. So this means that if we inject onto the 5 volt rail, and if we do so in a responsible manner, we're not expecting to hit any expensive silicon. So let's see if we can make this rough checklist in my mind. And I'm doing this on the fly right now as I record this. So, you know, if there's any other ideas that people have, let me know in the comments and we'll make our own checklist. So first things first, why do we think injecting is going to help? Well, we have a shorted power rail, but we don't know what component is shorted. And if we inject onto that power rail, the shorted component will get hot and identify itself to us. That's why we think it's going to help us solve the problem. Cool, first step done. Second step, do we know where to inject? Yes, we do. We found the short circuit. It's on the 5 volt rail. We know where our short circuit is. And that might sound obvious, but again, a lot of people will start injecting power without actually having found a short circuit. They'll just inject onto the main power rail, expecting the problem to just make itself known. And if you don't have a short circuit, well, nothing's going to get hot. We know we have a short circuit, we know that it's on the 5 volt rail, so we know that we're going to apply power to that 5 volt rail. So far so good. Okay, number three. Do we think there's a possibility that that short circuit is going to hit anything delicate that we might do additional damage to? Well, we've just gone through all of that. We're not going to hit CPU core, we're not going to hit the PCH. At least we don't think we're going to hit the PCH. But we do know that, you know, there is a possibility. But if the PCH has a fault, we're probably already lost. So, you know, put a pin in that. We're not going to hit the RAM and we're not going to hit the, the SMC. So all of these things are powered from different locations. So we've no reason to believe that when we inject power, it's going to go directly into silicon. So you might say, okay, well, when might you believe that that's going to happen? 
Let's say we had a short on PP bus G3 hot on the main power rail. Well, V core, CPU V core is on the main power rail. If one of these MOSFETs here was shorted through, so it had failed and turned itself into a wire, then what we're seeing is low is low resistance on the main power rail through that MOSFET and into the CPU core. That means when we inject power, it will go directly into the CPU core. That's not something we should inject on because we can we can prove that without um, injecting. And if you have direct a direct path into the core, you shouldn't inject power there because you might do more damage. So we know that we the five volt rail is not powering any of these silicon things. So again, if you're following along, if you're still with me, we should be okay. So that being the case, I believe we've we've uh, satisfied a checklist that means we're good to inject. I guess the last thing, number four, we could ask ourselves is. Is there some other way that we could find this fault without injecting that is less risky, that is less invasive than injection is? Well, what we could do is we could have a look at what else is on the 5 volt rail and we could see if we can find any visual damage somewhere. Well, okay, what's on the 5 volt rail? Let's look at the schematics here. So, let's see. If we look at this, this is the MOSFET for the 5 volt rail, which comes out through this inductor and the output is at pin 1 there. And as you can see, this splashes out all over the logic board. You can see it's going over to the right I.O. connector there, which is where we were measuring it earlier on. It's also going to some stuff over here, um, which is basically on the other side. So it looks like this, remember this is a mirrored board. so. What we're seeing here is the vias through to this I.O. connector. So that's all related. Um, we've got some stuff up here. Um, we've got this TPS chip here. That's going to be the regulator for this circuit. We've got another TPS chip there as well, which may be doing subrails. And then we've got over here, we've got a big capacitor here, a big 20, 220 microfarad, and that is going to here. And this is going to be for USB power. If we click on this chip, we can see that it powers the USB lines. This thing is going to output to um, the USB port, which is this guy here, by some means. Let's click on here and go USB. There we go. PP5VS3, that goes through this inductor and then it joins into this chip. So I mentioned it earlier on in the video that I suspected this would be a USB power fault. This is where I'm expecting to find the problem. So there's not actually a huge amount this rail is powering. It's mostly USB. So, okay, let's do a visual inspection then. I kind of thought this video was going to be a bit faster, but... Now we're on this train of thought, I feel like we should keep going. So here's the USB port. It's, there's some stains on there where this laptop has seen some liquid, but uh, I can tell you now I've looked into the USB port and there's no visual damage inside the port. So I don't, I don't believe that this is liquid damage. There's a big, there's that big 220 microfarad capacitor. This is a primary suspect because it's a capacitor. But, you know, there's no visual damage there. That I see there. Now I'm looking at it, now I'm looking at it from the side. That guy doesn't, you know, there's some rusty bits on there maybe. That's a bit weird. Again, it's possibly seen some liquid, but it's not corroded. Just check the other side of it. It's tarnished, but... That looks okay, if I'm honest. Okay. Let's flip the board over. So here's that power chip that we were looking at on the schematic. So this is the 5 volt rail going into the USB port. So this is the rail that actually powers stuff plugged into the USB port. It goes through this inductor. There's a capacitor there, which... You can barely see the separation there. I'm assuming that there's a via under that pad or something. That look a bit weird to you? I don't know. And then we've got this chip here. 
Well, I wonder if this port is if if this output is shorted as well. Let's check it. So I'll put my black probe on a screw hole again. And let's just have a quick look at this. So let's just check the USB port itself. And that's reading open line, which is just effectively infinite resistance to ground. So the, the port itself isn't shorted. Um, let's just check this guy, whatever it is. I think that's a capacitor. So this side of it should be ground in that case. Yeah, that seems fine. So this capacitor isn't shorted, neither is this rail. That means that this chip is probably okay. Here's the input to that chip. So this is on the 5 volt rail, so we're probably going to find our short circuit here. Yep, there it is. So this area is shorted. This capacitor might be faulty. Let's take a real good close look at that. Oh, you know what? Is that a crack? Have we just found it? It's really faint, but that looks fractured to me. So that is faint, but we have we have every reason to believe that this guy is a suspect, and it looks like it has a fracture in the side. So we could inject power, but also just using deduction and following the money and looking at the schematics, we may have been able to solve this without injection. So we've not satisfied the last item in the checklist. We have found another way of diagnosing this. Because I don't believe that there's anything that is going to harm this laptop by injecting, I'll do the injection anyway. And I'm going to say, I'll bet money that that capacitor is going to light up. Well, I'm not going to bet money because then I've got to give someone money. But I'm going to bet my... I'm going to bet my stake of this video. <laughs> what, am, what am I talking about? So I'll bet you that that capacitor is going to light up. Let's power up the power supply. And I'm setting it to 1 volt and 2 amps, which is a nice gentle injection value. I'm going to clamp my ground onto this screw hole up here. Turn on the power supply. And I want somewhere to inject on the back of the board. So I'm going to inject over here at these vias. I could inject directly onto that capacitor, but I don't like injecting directly onto the shorted component because then it looks like, even though you're not injecting directly into that component, it looks like you are. So, yeah. Just to elaborate on this, I want to inject at a remote spot so when something lights up, it shows how the power is finding another path through the board to the short. If we inject directly on the dead component, the way that the injection finds the fault for you isn't as obvious, and it just looks like we're deliberately heating a single component. It doesn't make a difference in practice, but for the sake of the demonstration, this is a better example. So here's the infrared P2 Pro. So you guys should be able to see what I'm doing now. I'll move across a little bit. <clears throat> so we're expecting a spot to appear. Let's see, where's my pointer? There. So we're expecting it to light up around there. So here we go. Oh. That's not what I expected. That's this guy. What are you and why are you getting hot? That's not what we thought was going to happen, everyone. This current sensor resistor down here just got hot. What's the deal with that? What is it doing? Why did it heat up? Why is a current sensor heating up? That doesn't make any sense. So that was this guy here. I injected on the 5 volt rail over here and this spot here, which is the battery charger regulator current sense resistor heated up. And that doesn't make any sense to me. Why did power come back here? And also, just why did this guy specifically heat up? This is a current sense resistor. It doesn't have a path to ground. Let's just check if that is shorted. 
I don't think this is relevant. I think something strange has happened here. I think I've injected in the wrong place or something like that. Oops. Right. That current sense resistor is not shorted. So that's an invalid result. What else could I have seen lighting up there? Oh, it could have been these guys. Look, that's 5 volts. This is on the 5VSO rail, but that's still a 5 volt rail. I may have misidentified what heated up, and I see, I thought it was this current sense resistor here, but it might have been this guy. Let's just measure and see if that's shorted, because it is on the 5 volt rail. Yep, that's shorted. Alright, so this is audio related, um, and that is on the 5 volt rail. Uh, let's just inject again and just see if that is in see exactly what lit up. I'll put the macro lens on my camera this time. So now we can get right up close to the board and we can see precisely what heats up. Aha, I was right. It's that capacitor, it's not a current sense resistor. Okay, all right, so let's back up to where we were. Bef let's back up a bit to that USB port and then back and then figure out where we've now branched off to because I was talking about USB ports and how I was positive it was going to be that capacitor and now we're off somewhere completely else on the board. So let's actually re let's reassess for a moment. So I said I thought it was going to be this guy here because it almost looked like it was fractured and this is the 5 volt rail and we have our short circuit visible at this point because it's on the 5 volt rail and it connects to a USB port so it conveniently lines up with the customer's information about how this failed while they were using an external hard drive and stuff like that and you know that fra I thought I saw a fracture in the side of that but I had to go real close to see what I thought kind of looked like a fracture so hmm so I reckon that guy was going to light up but what actually lit up for a moment, I thought it was this current sense resistor, but that would make no sense because this isn't on the 5 volt rail. But actually, it was this here, this capacitor, a bit to the left, which is on the 5 volt rail and powers the audio amplifier. So this is the guy that's heating up. So we found a failed capacitor on the 5 volt rail. Now, initially, we didn't spot this because this is on the 5 volt SO rail. So... I feel like we should trace this back and see where it gets its power from. So I said, ah, look at that. So from our spider web here, I said we had an area over here, we had an area up there, we had the 5 volt regulators, and we had the USB. What it also went to was here. But I kind of dismissed that. It goes through this jumper here and these xwa jumpers i don't i don't fully understand what these actually are because if you look for the if you look for this component here on the board you won't find it and i don't fully understand what these things actually represent someone in the comments correct me on this i believe it's like an internal jumper in the board or something like that but if you look here it turns from pp5vs3 into pp5v SO audio and now it becomes this spot here and like if we'd seen that originally when we clicked on the uh, the if when we clicked on the inductor output this would have been very suspicious because there was a bunch of large capacitors over here so that's how I missed it so credit where it's due um, injecting power lit up the fault straight away but that's how it goes sometimes this is one of those annoying times where what I'm trying to say in the video and what we actually saw didn't quite line up, but maybe this mistake was a good learning experience for everyone involved. Oh well, let's take that 
capacitor off the board and see if our problem disappears. So this is a 47 microfarad. Let's just look this up actually. So let's go to the schematic. So this is the input capacitor for the audio amplifier. And as you can see, that's going to a speaker connector. So this is the left speaker amplifier. It's a 47 microfarad, 6.3 volt tantalum capacitor. Uh, that's probably going to be a pain in the ass to find, but I might, I think I've got a donor board one of those. So let's get this guy off the board. So we've got another tantalum cap nearby there, the one on the left, and tantalum capacitors don't like heat. So I'm going to wet the joins on this one just so we can take it off of the board as quickly and simply as possible. Um, I need to get a second a soldering station set up again just so I can dual wield soldering irons to solve this. So let's now check if our original short circuit has disappeared with that capacitor removed. Black probe on ground and on the regulator inductor. And we're now seeing high resistance there, so we've got kilo ohms and rising. Excellent. And we can check this uh, capacitor that we just removed. Just turn that around because it's polarized, and we should find this guy's short circuit. And that's a shorted capacitor. Excellent. All right. So we need a new capacitor to put there now. Um, the easiest source for that is this breaker board that I have here. Um, this is another MacBook board. It's a slightly different one. This one is an 8203476, so it's a slightly older one. But the audio circuit down here looks identical. Um, so I'll just double check that it's the same capacitor for good measure, but I can't see a world where it isn't. So I said 3476. And down here, search, and that again, 47 microfarad, 6.3 volts, no problem. Once again, I'm going to wet the connections on it just so I can get it off as cleanly as possible. I'm not sure that wetting was really very effective, but it'll work. We didn't need a lot of time there. I've had to remove um, I've had to remove these tantalum caps before while I was sitting on like a ground plane, and it was pretty horrifying. And I probably damaged the the capacitors, but this one came off fairly easily. Wow, everything else is flowing straight away except the cap that I want. Okay. Wow. I'm going to quickly check the capacitance of this guy just to make sure that it's vaguely in spec. So I'll go to capacitance mode and I'm going to try and stab it. Let's see if I can do this without ejecting it into the room somewhere. A big cap so it might take it a moment there we go that's reading just shy of 45 microfarads so it's a scooch low however capacitors have like a 20 percent margin of error on them 20 percent tolerance so it doesn't matter if we're a couple of microfarads out as more or less as long as we're in the correct order of magnitude at the most significant digit we'll be okay if i'm honest so Let's put this onto our new board. And I'm going to try and soldering iron hero this because I'd like to not hot air the capacitor again. So I will just get some wick and clear up one of the pads. And then we should be able to do um, we should be able to do this just with the iron alone. And that just reduces the stress that we're putting onto the capacitor. Ceramic capacitors don't really care about heat, so it's not an issue. Um, but uh, these tantalum caps, they, they don't like the heat, so 
That's why I'm actually trying to be careful. Right, and I'll just turn the board so I can get my hand in at the right angle. And if I just reheat that pad, it should just flow onto it. The problem is I've got an IC there and there, so it's difficult to get the it's difficult to get this tip in flat. Maybe a little bit straighter. I should have quit while I was ahead. There we go. Beautiful. There we go, that's pretty good. Is it flat? Oh, not even slightly. God damn it. It's on stilts. This always happens to me when... This always happens to me when I try and soldering iron hero. Uh, Alright, I'm going to reflow it. Technically, it's fine. It doesn't matter if it's standing up off the board, but someone will criticize me for it, so let's just reflow that guy again. No! It's okay, it's okay. It's just a little airborne. It's still good, it's still good. There we go. Send it. Right, and one more time. Let's just check that we're not shorted. Black probe on ground, and our regulator says... Killer ohms and climbing. Lovely. Okay, charger plugging in. Bam. All right, we have what looks like a power on signature, although that might just be battery charge again. It's possibly a bit of both, actually. Um, oh, there we go. We have Chime. We have an Apple logo. There we go. Okay, that is a working MacBook again. So I hope that one was kind of interesting. Um, I think we'll have to put a pin in the um, uh, injection checklist and refine that a bit better. Um, or maybe I just got unlucky with this one. Um, that's also just confirmation bias. I was expecting it to be USB, so I was looking really hard at those USB capacitors trying to find something wrong with them. Um, but hey, it showed you the diagnostic process. It also showed you how confirmation bias can lead you astray. So in a way, I was kind of right. I mean, the laptop got fixed, so... Thanks for watching, everyone. Bye!